The Grape Nuts Flakes program, starring Orson Welles, who is pinch-hitting for Jack Benny, with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, Rochester, and yours truly, Don Wilson. glad man, friends, for aren't we all glad to get news of a thrifty, swifty, appetizing breakfast dish for these up and at them early mornings? Then wait till we all tell you all about Grape Nuts Flakes, the crisp and toasty brown breakfast cereal that's always ready for breakfast before you are. And ready to eat Grape Nuts Flakes are as temptingly good to eat as they are easy to serve. It's your old friend of the famous Grape Nuts flavor, you know, turned out in delectable, crisp, and crunchy flake form with that same malty-rich, sweet-as-a-nut goodness, a flavor that makes Grape Nuts Flakes America's fastest-growing breakfast cereal. And think of this, too, homemakers. Every time you buy a big 12-ounce economy package of Grape Nuts Flakes, you're saving on ration stamps because you don't need them, not for thrifty, plentiful Grape Nuts Flakes. <laughs> Take it from there, played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, before we start the program, let us reenact for you a little scene which took place a short while ago in a drugstore near the NBC building here in Hollywood. The time exactly 15 minutes before this broadcast. Take it away, drugstore! <laughs> One tuna fish on whole weight. One tuna fish coming up. Gosh, it's crowded in here. Say, Don, do you think I have time for a sandwich before the show? Why, yes, Mary, if you hurry. I think I'll have a dish of Tutti Frutti ice cream myself. <laughs> Watch it, Don. <laughs> if you put on one more chin, you can throw away your vest. <laughs> no kidding. Now, Mary, will you stop ribbing me about my weight? I'm not so heavy. Go on. Every time you step into an empty elevator, the operator says, that's all, please, and up you go. <laughs> Oh, Gilroy. What'll it be, Mary? Uh, just a sandwich. I'll have a hamburger. A hamburger? Yes, ma'am. Oh, Radcliffe. Yes, Gilroy. Hitch old Dobbin to a bun. <laughs> you want something else, Mary? No, that'll be all. Uh, would you mind taking my order, bud? Uh, gladly. What do you have, wobble tummy? <laughs> hmm? Well, I'll have a dish of ice cream, please. Make it uh, tutti frutti. Uh, you can have tutti, but there's no more fruity for the duration. <laughs> How's that, Radcliffe? Gilroy, you're really bumping your gums now. <laughs> yeah. Why don't you two jerks give up sodas and write for radio? We do. We just sold a lot of gags to old Red Skelton. Red Skelton? No, old Red Skelton, his father. <laughs> Well, that's my fault for talking to you. Oh, hello, Phil. Hiya, Mary. Hello, Donzo. Well, Phil, is your orchestra all rehearsed for the program? Who rehearses? If I ever told my boys they was playing something wrong, they'd say, how do you know? Then I'd be stuck. <laughs> <laughs> Take it easy. Relax. That's my motto. Well, I hope Orson doesn't find out you didn't rehearse. Who oh, wealthy? Why, him and me as pals. We gave a lecture together at UCLA just last night. You and Orson gave a talk at the university? Oh, Orson did all the talking. I just sat there and let them professors feel my head once in a while. <laughs> what? No, soft. You should have been there. I started to pull a couple of gags and Orson wrapped me on the bean with his pointer. Get a load of this lump up there. Well, it be, Twitch, a promo seltzer? No, thanks. I had one across the street. I just came in here to burp. Ha, ha, ha! Is that a Lulu? <laughs> oh, you and your Lulus. Say, Gil, is this man annoying you? No, Radcliffe, put down that cupcake. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that Radcliffe's really a demon. Oh, hello, Dennis. Hello, Miss Livingston. Say, how's the hamburger you're eating? All it needs is a jockey. <laughs> 
Gosh, Mr. Harris, where'd you get that big lump on your head? From Orson Welles, that too. Orson Welles. <laughs> you want something to eat, Dennis? You better order. Now, what do you want? I think I'll have the special sandwich. Peanut brittle on whole wheat. <laughs> you mean peanut butter. No, look, it says right here, peanut brittle. That's a misprint, kid. I'll bring you a peanut butter sandwich. Nothing doing. It says peanut brittle here, and that's what I want. <laughs> now, listen. I know my rights. <laughs> Dennis, if I wasn't a lady, I'd knock him right off that stool. Now behave yourself. Hey, kids, get a load of who's coming in. It's Miss Harrington, Orson's secretary. Hello, Miss Harrington. Hello, young man. Good afternoon, everybody. Hello, Butch. <laughs> hmm. By the way, Miss Harrington, how's Mr. Wells feeling today? Oh, he's in a splendid mood. He found his yo-yo under the dresser. <laughs> What's your order, ma'am? I want this place tidied up and this counter cleared. Mr. Wells is about to honor this hash house with his presence. <laughs> yes, ma'am. And incidentally, young man, when did you put on that shirt you're wearing? In 1937, when I left Stratford, Connecticut. <laughs> well, change it immediately. Yes, ma'am. And as for your gruesome friend with the wide part in his hair... <laughs> That's gotta be me. <laughs> Would you mind lying under the counter until Mr. Wells leaves? Gladly. <laughs> My feet is killing me. <laughs> Attention. Attention, everybody. Mr. Wells is approaching. <laughs> lovely today. Thanks, Orson. I stopped by your house to give you a lift to the studio, but the butler said you'd already gone. The butler? Oh, did Papa have that tailcoat on again? <laughs> well, at any rate, I'm sorry I missed you. There doesn't seem to be a vacant stool here. Uh, take mine and I'll sit on your lap, baby face. <laughs> That's sweet of you, Mary. Uh, don't you think it's a little early in the day for romance? Well... Take it when you can get it. That's my motto. <laughs> Dennis, please. Oh, boy, boy. Yes, yes, Mr. Wells. I'll have a cup of cold consomme madrilene, breast of guinea hen under glass, and a bottle of Chateau Lafitte 1928. Hey, where do you think you are, the Brown Derby? Get back under that counter. <laughs> yes, Mr. Wells. <laughs> Whoop, bump my head. <laughs> Mr. Wells, I don't think you'll have time to eat. We're due on the air in a few minutes. Oh, very well. By the way, did you pick up the sketch we're doing on the program tonight for Mr. Benny's writers? Here it is, Mr. Wells. Would you mind okaying it? Not at all. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> now, that's awful. Miss Harrington, take this out in the alley and burn it immediately. Yes, Mr. Wells. Burn the script? But, Orson, what are we going to do for a play tonight? I shall write one myself. Hey, Mr. Wells, if you're looking for a comedy sketch, my partner and I wrote one that's terrific. Yes! Dynamite. Get back under that counter. Yes, Mr. Wells. <laughs> you wait for that long enough. It hurts. <laughs> Sight gag, ladies and gentlemen. Well, how about it, Mr. Wells? Do you want to buy our play? <laughs> yes, deliver it to me at NBC as quickly as possible. Thanks, Mr. Wells. Uh, come on, everybody, follow me. Last one in the studio is a rotten egg. <laughs>
That was You'd Be So Nice to Come Home To, says here, played by Phil Harris and his orchestra. Phil, you can stop waving your baton now. The number's over. Oh, yeah, thanks. Don't mention it. You see, old boy, uh, I didn't get a chance to rehearse that selection, so consequently, I didn't realize it had reached its termination. Uh, if you get what I mean. Uh, that is due to your lackadaisical inadvertence. The conclusion of that number found you in a state of oblivious lethargy. Get what I mean? No, but my lump is throbbing. <laughs> so I notice it's fairly dancing. Uh, by the way, Mary, I've been meaning to ask you, how's Jack coming along? Is he over his cold? If he was over his cold, you wouldn't be here, brother. <laughs> Dennis? Yes, Jack is much better arts, and he's resting at the Arizona Biltmore in Phoenix. The Arizona Biltmore? Isn't that rather expensive for Jack? Expense means nothing to him. He was delirious when he checked in. <laughs> that must be the reason. You know, fellas, I got a postcard from Mr. Benny this morning. He asked me to send his golf bag right away. His golf bag? Say, the old boy must be getting better if he wants to play a little golf. What do you mean, golf? If I know Benny, he landed a job picking grapefruit. <laughs> Now, wait a minute, Mary. Let's all be fair to Jack. He doesn't think of work all the time. Well, of course not. Jack can relax and enjoy vacation like anybody else. Oh, yeah? He took me to Catalina on the boat one time and played his fiddle all the way over. Well, that doesn't mean he was playing for money. Don't tell me. I was passing the hat. <laughs> Just the same, I'm sure Jack is getting a good rest in Phoenix. Incidentally, that gives me a splendid idea. I think I'll call Jack and say hello to him. Right now? Of course, right now, Miss Harrington. Get me Mr. Benny at the Arizona Biltmore in Phoenix. Yes, Mr. Wells. Imagine talking to Phoenix, Arizona just like that. Ain't a phone a wonderful thing? It sure is. Say, Mr. Harris, who invented the telephone? Well, Alexander Graham invented the bell. The rest I don't know nothing about. <laughs> Mr. Harris, the telephone in its entirety was invented by Alexander Graham Bell, which I can pronounce. Come, come, Miss Harrington. What's the delay on that call? Well, I have the Arizona Biltmore, but they can't seem to locate Mr. Benny. Let me have that phone, please. Hello? Hello, operator? I'd like to talk to Jack Benny. What? He's not registered. He's not a guest there. Uh, have a look out in the lobby. Maybe he's a bellboy. <laughs> bellboy? With his flat feet, he could be the house dick. <laughs> Bill, please. Now, operator, I'd like to talk to Mr. Benny. Oh, his temperature went down. He checked out. Oh, very well, I'll call him there. Goodbye. That's strange. What's the matter? Did Jack leave the Arizona Biltmore? Yes, it seems he's now stopping at the Jasmine Blossom Auto Court. <laughs> <laughs> the Jasmine Blossom? Hey, I just thought of something. Jasmine Blossom. That's J.B., the same initials as Mr. Benny. That's right, Dennis, and I'm sure Jack will come home with some lovely monogram towels. <laughs> Miss Harrington, remind me to call Mr. Benny first thing tomorrow morning at the Jasmine Blossom Auto Court. Yes, Mr. Wells. Oh, excuse me. Come in. Well, it's those two merry madcaps from the soda fountain. Hello, fellows. Hello, Mr. Wells. Here's that comedy sketch we wrote for you. There's a little mayonnaise on it, but it's very jolly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, fellows. By the way, would you like to stay and hear your little gem? I don't know. Should we stay, Gil? We can't stay. That fat lady is waiting for her cheeseburger. <laughs> oh, yes. Let's go. Wait till I open the door. <laughs> well, let's see what they've written here. So far, nothing but mayonnaise. A little crude, but it'll get by. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for our feature attraction this evening, we are going to present a mystery melodrama entitled Death at Midnight or the <laughs> Murder Case. In this drama, I will play the role of Inspector Wells of police headquarters. <laughs> Bill, you'll be my assistant, Sergeant Harris, and Dennis, you will be my other assistant, Sergeant Day. It is your duty to help me solve a horrible crime. Okay, but I didn't do it, I tell you. I didn't do it! You're a policeman, of course you didn't do it. <laughs> Don't be too sure. And Mary. It's always a guy you never suspect, silly. <laughs> Dennis, please. Now, Mary. Yes, Arthur? In our sketch, you play the part of the mysterious lady in black. Six of your husbands have strangely disappeared, and you've just married your seven. I'm a busy little girl, aren't I? <laughs> Decidedly. Well, that takes care of the casting for our play. Oh, I beg your pardon, Orson, but haven't you overlooked me? Don, overlooking you is like losing a bass drum in a phone booth. <laughs> However, you should be the butler. And now, ladies and gentlemen, this play will go on immediately after... I'll take it. Hello? Hello, Mr. Wells. This is Rochester.
Hello, Rochester. What do you want? Mr. Wells, up to now, working for you has been a pleasure, but trouble has reared its ugly head. Trouble? <laughs> it's that Chinese cook of yours. We just don't speak the same language. Well, naturally. <laughs> naturally. What's the difficulty between you and Chong? You know those pork chops I got at the market yesterday? The ones I had to use commando tactics to obtain? <laughs> yes, yes. Well, that cook of yours wants to cut them up into little pieces for chop suey. That's vandalism. <laughs> now, calm down, Rochester. Any man that would treat a pork chop like that would pull the chair out from under Whistler's mother. <laughs> Rochester. <laughs> Rochester, don't get so excited. Good heavens, the way you... <laughs> The way you talk, you think those chops were radium. I can get radium tomorrow. Let's see you get some pork chops. <laughs> now, Rochester, there's no reason, there's no reason why you and Chong can't be good friends. Put Chong on the phone. Okay, here he is. Hello, Chong. Hello, Ma, Mr. Wells. Now, Chong, I want you and Rochester to get along with each other. What's all this quarreling about? So he told me. <laughs> Anything else? You're absolutely right. <laughs> now, Chong, here's what you do. Cook the chop suey for us and give Rochester a couple of pork chops for himself. Okay, Mr. Wells. I'm very happy. Now put Rochester back on the phone. Rochester? Yes, Mr. Wells. Everything is all settled. John's uh, giving you two pork chops. You can cook them any way you want to. Cook them? I bought myself a gold frame. I'm going to hang them in my bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> so long, Mr. Wells. Goodbye, Rochester. <laughs> Well, I guess that's straightened out. Sing, Dennis.
just heard It Can't Be Wrong, and that was Dennis Day singing. And Dennis, I don't have to tell you, that was very good. I'll say you don't. I heard it. Uh-huh. <laughs> Dennis, you shouldn't pat yourself on the back like that. It's quite hammy. You should talk, brother. <laughs> We've got something there. And now, ladies and gentlemen, go away, Dennis. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we will present our thrilling, baffling, spine-tingling mystery melodrama, Death at Midnight. As the scene opens, we find Inspector Wells in his office at police headquarters. Curtain, music! Is that the phone, Inspector? No, it's a preview for For Whom the Bell's Told. (laughs) Hello, Police Headquarters, Inspector Wells speaking. Help, help! Come over at once, I'm going to be murdered! Get away from that phone, you little double-crosser, I'll let you have it. Help, help! (laughs) What was that, Inspector? Oh, one of those gin rummy arguments. (laughs) And uh, before I forget it, Harris, you're supposed to be a policeman. What's the idea of coming to work in those loud sport clothes? My girlfriend thinks I'm a bookmaker. That's no excuse. Now, here. Here's your badge, your uniform, your club. Okay, where's my flat feet? On the opposite end of your flat head. Oh, you... (laughs) Oh, Inspector! What is it, Sergeant Day? Somebody has been passing phony dollar bills all over town, and I've got one of them. A dollar bill, eh? And how do you know it's phony? Washington is wearing Lincoln's beard. Hmm. Let me see that. You're right. And he's wearing Lincoln's hat, too. Hey, were those two guys roommates? Of course not. Hmm... Washington wearing Lincoln's beard. This is the worst job of counterfeiting I ever saw. You think that's something? Turn the bill over. Good heavens. Hedda Hopper is sitting on the eagle. (laughs) Nice work day. We've got to report this to Washington. I thought he was dead. Washington, (laughs) D.C. Hello? Hello, Inspector Wells speaking. Hello, Specky. This is Mrs. Lillian Gahagan Crumdike speaking. You know, the lady in black. Why did you call me up, you naughty girl? Have you bumped off another husband? I didn't have anything to do with it. I went to the library just now, and he was plumped over the radio with the Fred Allen program going full blast. Oh, was your husband dead? He must have been. He didn't turn it off. (laughs) So long, Specky. Uh, Hold everything, Mrs. Crumdike. I'll be right over. Sergeant Harris, Sergeant Day. Yes, Yes, Inspector. Come on, boys. We're going over to investigate a murder. And I have a hunch this crime was committed by... By... By who? I can't make this out. There's mayonnaise on it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go, fellows! Calling all cars. Calling all cars. Teddy Lamar locked in her closet. Take it easy, boys. <laughs> That is all. This is the house right here. Harris, they break down that door. Yes, sir. gentlemen. Did you ring? Uh, no, we didn't. We're the police. Who are you? I'm Wobble Tummy, the butler. The butler, eh? Now tell me, what do you know about this crime? I don't know anything, sir. When the murder took place, I was down at the grocery store buying a package of toasty brown sweets and a grape nuts flake. Grape nuts flakes, eh? Make a nut. Uh, a note of that, Harris. Yes, sir. Now come clean, you. You're talking to the law. What do you know about grape nuts flakes? I know they're America's fastest growing flake cereal, and they're famous for their malty rich flavor, and the grape nuts flakes come in a 12 ounce economy size package. Harris, this man is concealing something. Keep an eye on him. Gotcha. <laughs> now I think I'll grill Mrs. Crumdike. I have a hunch she killed her husband. You know that saying, Chercher la femme, don't you? No, I don't. Well, you ought to learn it. It's all the rage now. <laughs> Well, the blue coats are here. Hi, it's Becky. Hello, Mrs. Crumdike. Where's the body? Right here, and I'm wearing a new dress. <laughs> I mean your husband's body. Oh, that old thing. Hmm. 
a strange coincidence, Mrs. Crumdike, but all of your husbands have met untimely deaths. Take your first husband, the big game hunter. What about him? He went on a hunting trip to Canada with him, and he's the first thing you shot. Well, he looked like a moose. <laughs> no excuse. Now, I want a confession, Mrs. Crumdike, and I want it now. Start talking! Well... It's no use. You murdered your husband, and you might as well admit it. Well, here we go again. Lies! Lies! Nothing but lies. You hated your husband, and you couldn't stand him any longer. Now, tell me, how did you kill him? Well... I don't believe it. <laughs> I'm arresting you, Mrs. Crumdike. Arresting you for the murder of your husband. Tell me... What's his first name? Well... Otto J. Crumdike. <laughs> Slap the bracelets on her, Harris, and let's go. Oh, Inspector, Mrs. Crumdike is innocent. Innocent? Yes, yeah, someone just threw a note in the window and it solves the whole case. Give me that note. Where is it? I ate it. It was covered with mayonnaise. Oh. <laughs> Come on, Harris. Let's get over to Hedy Lamar's house. She may still be trapped. <laughs> sit down to a big, tempting bowl full of appetizing, baldy, rich grape nut flakes. Aren't you pleased with yourself? Well, you should be. Because it's smart to go for a breakfast dish like that. One chuck full of swell flavor, plus wonderful all-around nourishment. And you're in good company, too, for your neighbors all over the country are also calling for grape nut flakes. The farmer, the salesman, the welder, the kind of folks who get things done. They start with a nourishing breakfast, and Grape Nuts Flakes are just that. For Grape Nuts Flakes are a whole grain cereal, crammed full of whole grain food values, including iron, niacin, and vitamin B1 for appetite, nerves, and tip-top energy. Vigor, vitality, vitamins. That's V eating for you with delicious, toasty brown Grape Nuts Flakes. <laughs> next Sunday night, ladies and gentlemen. This is your obedient servant, Orson Welles. And Mary, I want to compliment you on your performance tonight in the role of Mrs. Crumdike. I was pretty crummy, huh? Well... Good night, folks. Good night, doll. This program was written by Radcliffe Marlowe and Gilroy Beloyne with Mayonnaise by Orson Welles. <laughs>